Welcome. This is uh, lecture number nine on uh, capital cost estimating and calculation of the rate of return on investment. Ultimately, what we're going to be getting to is trying to answer the question, what is the purpose of the power plant? Right. So far, we've talked about some of the ther thermodynamics of the power plant, but now we got to shift gears and actually say, why are we building the power plant in the first case? So. First of the topics will be cost estimating, and I have this slide up here because this is from um, the, the U.S. E uh, Energy Information Administration, Energy Admi Energy Information Administration, and uh, they each year they uh, put out cost estimates from power plants, and what they um, will always present um, is a total system levelized cost as well as the components that go into that. So one of the components is the levelized capital cost. It has the same units as the total system levelized cost, and those units are some kind of year dollars divided by megawatt hours. Uh, in so it's the, of course, it, you have to make sure the year dollars, and then um, what are you doing here is you're levelizing by um, megawatts, so that you what you're getting kind of is some kind of like levelized cost for electricity. Um, and the what goes into it, this levelized cost is going to contain the capital costs that we're going to be talking about today. Um, and then the le total levelized cost is what tells you something about the amount of revenue that you'd have to receive for each megawatt hour produced at the power plant in order for this to essentially break even and pay back your investors at whatever equity and percentage they're getting, or equity rates of return they're getting. A um, couple things I want to point out. Um, new for this year is this caveat down at the bottom. One is, is non-dispatchable. Right, this, uh, this is new. They've actually put this caveat on that um, wasn't there in prior ones, years as you'll see which is that, of course, most of these renewable ones, not all of them, but some of them, are not dispatchable, I mean, they're not base load. Uh, and what they're saying is they're not looking at the cost of the base of the power plant plus the batteries that would require to make it a base load power plant. They're just looking at the, let's say, either wind or solar itself. And um, so if you look on here, one, the one thing that should stand out is that the lowest price of electricity is for natural gas combined cycle power plants. And it's the lowest by a significant factor. Um, next closest one is, is going to be um, well natural gas with, com with capture and then and, and the hydroelectric dam, which actually the variability on this one is large. But um, what you can see for other base load dispatchal powers, the next closest one is a coal power plant which is uh, about 50% more expensive. And then you can see some of these start just going up in price. If you have coal with capture, so it's, it starts getting really large. Nuclear down here um, is almost twice as expensive as a natural gas combined cycle power plant. Um, and one uh, point on one thing here, solar photovoltaic. Watch this one as I go back in time. This is 2011, and it was at $156 per megawatt hour. 2010, so back more time. And um, what we'll see here is that solar PV was up in the $400, right? So there's been some drastic changes in the solar PV. Other than that, um, the other major change was that between the 2009-2010 estimate, there was a uh, very large decrease in the levelized cost of the natural gas combined cycle power plants. You can see nuclear hasn't really even changed. It's 119. It really hasn't changed much over the last couple of years. Okay, and now um, if you're working for a company, um, most of the time what you'll be doing is you'll have some kind of program, perhaps if you're using Aspen, Aspen Plus program, you'll have that cost estimator built right into the program. These things are expensive. So that's not what we're going to be doing in this course, even though when you actually, if you were working at an industry, you'd be using whatever your company um, uses as their cost estimator. And um, normally you're always going to be following some kind of guidelines. Um, a useful guideline that um, my work, 
uh, National Energy Technology Laboratory uses is um, this guideline set by the Association for the Advancement of Cost Engineering, AACE, and that will go into how you develop a methodol methodology for doing your cost estimating. So what we'll be doing in this class is just kind of taking and assuming that these methodologies We'll be taking values based off of these methodologies rather than kind of focusing on what goes into and what's not included in these cost estimates. Because a lot of times it's like questions of are you including overhead, contingencies, there's all sorts of things like various, let's call them factors of s uh, safety factors or factors of safety. Kind of like if you were designing a bridge, you'd start, you'd have certain like factors of safety that you'd be putting. So um, the AACE has a various definitions of cost estimates, and um, what we'll be doing in this class project is a, what we consider a class five estimate. This is in preparing off of very limited information, and subsequently they're all going to have wide ranges of, um, of values. Um, but either NETL or something my thesis, or probably more working in the area of a class four estimate, which means that. You have some information and um, you've done some scale up development, but it's not to the point where when you're at a class three or two estimate, these are actually what are being used for basis for budgets and or for grants, funding, and um, by the time you get to a class one or a class two estimate, you're sitting, this is what you'd actually be sharing with unique investors into the project to demonstrate why they'll be getting, <laughs> why they actually will be getting their equity return on investment as you're telling them that they will. So um, in this class, um, we'll either be using stuff from NTL or if it's just general generic equipment and you want to get a cost estimation, there's a useful site on the web. Um, and you may know of other ones, but uh, here, here's one. It's called uh, uh, M-A-T-C-H-E. The capital cost, uh, and if you can see here from here, there's um, if you need various reactors or compressors or stuff like that, they have some cost estimates, estimates in there, and you can change the size of them or what type of materials they're made out of, or like the compressor, you can also vary what type of pressure ratios they have. Okay, and uh, PEM, um, it's the Department of Ener Energy's EERE that puts out their cost estimates. Um, I've already put those on Blackboard. They're under the course documents. And um, in this presentation, you'll see some more of the solid oxide fuel cell cost estimates. And um, <coughs> what's important for when we're going to be doing the homeworks and exams and class projects is to convert what's normally given in dollars per kilowatt. That's normally what industry is, is giving these as, is dollars per kilowatt. And... Um, what we want is dollars per active area, right? Maybe dollars per centimeter squared or dollars per meter squared. Because um, we actually, when we're doing our models, we're going to actually be putting in what is the I active area of the fuel cell. So dollars per kilowatt have to be converted. And I've already done this because, um, but my question to you all is, how would you go between dollars per kilowatt and dollars per centimeter squared? What information would you need? Because, um, um, as I said before, in in all of our programs, we're going to be putting in that we ha need certain area, and this will allow us then to vary current densities or pressures, or maybe temperatures, and um, and as you can see, dollars per kilowatt, you wouldn't be able to vary these. You're kind of fixed at whatever they were. You know, dollars per kilowatt at a given current density pressure air stoichiometric ratio. So he, um, here's some um, cost estimating that's coming from our fuel cell energy. And a um, couple of things I want to point out on this slide. Um, one of which is down at the bottom. For their stack costs, um, what they're saying is that Labor is only a very, very small amount of the cost that goes into these stacks. Now, uh, materials are actually 77%, which means that these solid oxide fuel cells are highly dependent on the cost of materials. 
and the same could is in maybe not the same ratios here, but uh, pen fuel cells being uh, with using platinum are also heavily dependent on the price of platinum. The solid oxide fuel cells are highly dependent on the price of steel and on uh, zirconia and yttria and other uh, oxides. Um, I do want to point out that there's been a general trend general trend in uh, decrease in uh, stack capital costs and um, one, one thing to point out here is um, looking at whether or not you're using dollars per net AC or uh, dollars per kilowatt in that gross gross DC it's a really important thing to make sure you have this too because uh, there will be slight differences coming out of your fuel cell if you're if you're talking about dollars per kilowatt for net AC versus gross DC, and um, so fuel cell energy also uh, publishes results, um, looking not only at the stacks but also if you the balance of plant equipment, and some of this balance of plant equipment might are the fuel cell enclosures, fuel cell piping, blowers, expanders, heaters and coolers, the inverter. Uh, and that AC DC inverter actually is one of the major balance of plants. Right, this is the inverter that goes from a, uh, from DC to AC. You have some other instruments of control, water, uh, perhaps steam and steam turbines or a heat recovery gener steam generator. And those uh, balance of plant uh, costs are actually uh, significant compared to the stack costs. And I do want to point out here that these cost estimates are assuming that two, almost 600 megawatt power plants are being manufactured per year. So this is much higher than that what actually is being uh, produced right now, which is probably more at the tens of kilowatts per year, tens to hundreds of kilowatts per year. So there's at least a couple, three, at least three orders of magnitude. Um, farther to go to you hit the 600 megawatts per year being manufactured. Another thing I want to point out is that uh, shown here were the phase one and phase two. Phase um, I've also looked up the phase three cost estimates which can be found at the above site which work out to be total about maybe a little around six, um, six hundred dollars per kilowatt net AC for, for combined stacks and balance of Um, but and uh, when you get to uh, these kind of cost estimates, so fuel cells can make um, very competitive sources of economically competitive sources of power. When compared against other type of power plants that have to capture and sequester CO2. Uh, for example, here are a couple of cases in which you either have a pulverized coal, that's a PC, an integrated gasification combined cycle power plant. That's the next one. Uh, the next one, the next couple are when you have gasification, you turn coal into a syngas, and sending that syngas not to a gas turbine but to a fuel cell. And um, here you can see the general efficiencies uh, compared to the higher the amount of electricity divided by the higher heating value of the coal. Some of the capital costs in dollars per kilowatt net AC, and these are. Um, how much water is used. Right. Fuel cell systems don't require nearly as much water because um, either the size, the, you're, you're decreasing the size of your steam turbine or is, is one way of thinking about it. And um, what, you, what you find at the end is that when you're comparing these plants with, with capture and compression and storage of CO2, fuel cells are typically giving you the lowest levelized cost of electricity. Okay, uh, now we're going to change gears a little bit and talk about, okay, if we're doing cost estimating the real world, what are the things we have to keep in our head? So,
So you can take that equation and um, you can work through the steps, but you can separate out um, the summation. You can break that down into uh, the capital costs if it's like occurring in let's say in one year, and, or maybe decommission costs, and you can separate the fixed or variable and fuel costs. And uh, what you can get when you work through that, you'll get an equation um, where you have your L series now going to be equal to some kind of capex per E, which is some kind of like dollars per kilowatt kilowatt hour, and then it gets multiplied by um, your in interest rate, and uh, it's also a function of N, the lifetime of the power plant. Um, and then your decommissioning factor is going to have a similar type of, uh, if you have decommissioning factors at year N um, and capital costs happening at year zero, this is what this equation would look like. And then at the end you have some kind of fixed and variable and that's going to include fuel. And those are going to be given now in, in dollar, let's say dollars per kilowatt hour. And um, so you can think of an LCRE as kind of this linear analysis in which you assume a certain discount rate. And that's what allows you to separate out costs associated with capital, labor, and fuel. And you can see it's going to be the summation of all these different terms. Uh, there's going to be a couple problems with LCRE. Not, um, and as long as you know what kind of the problems are, you, they're easy to work around. So uh, one is that, of course, different types of electricity generate different average revenues per kilowatt hour. So different types of power plants e for each kilowatt hour that they produce don't get paid the same amount of revenue. Um, a type of power plant that turns on to the middle of the day when the electricity prices are high are going to get a much higher dollar per kilowatt hour than some kind of power plant that's either base load and just going you know steady the whole day or maybe some power plant that for some reason could only turn on at night maybe when electricity prices are low. Um, and so part of it is when you turn on, you know, at what, what, what time of day your plant is operating. Another one would be whether or not you can, s you can go into what they call a day ahead electricity market. So a lot of times, if you can guarantee that you'll be producing so much power, um, and if you can guarantee that the day before, you're going to be getting typically higher prices um, than if you can only the day of say that you're going to be able to turn on. Um, and the last thing is that you can sometimes get paid for not even producing electricity, um, just for what we call a standing in like uh, reserve. A lot of times there's a bunch of different reserves, like if you're reserved for a blackout or if you're just reserved for if there's a high load of electricity coming on that day. And um, you can get sometimes get paid for not even generating um, electricity. And that's something that you'd have to complicate some LCB analysis. Um, now, th another thing that complicates it is the assumption of the discount rate. And remember that discount rate told you something about, you know, what's the interest rates you could get for equally risky projects, and um, that include inflation is somehow in them. Right. So it should discount rate should should be a pretty straightforward thing, though you'll see that people use numbers that widely vary from like. 0% all the way up to, you know, 20% rates of return on, uh, of interest rates. So, as long as you know what went into the calculation, so you can then, you know, if you wanted to look at somebody's work, you could, if, you, if they told you their capital costs and all that, you probably could take their numbers and compare that to something you've done, even though you may have done it at a di different discount rate. But no, just make sure that you know what that discount rate was that was used in the analysis. Sometimes it's not given, which means that you've presented an LCRE estimate and it's not going to be very useful. Okay, um, and the other thing is it's got units that are uh, problematic, I'll just say. You know, we're here, we got dollars per kilowatt hour. Sometimes people forget to put the dollar, what year dollars. Okay, that's it. And then it's just the fact that we got a possible, if we want to look at you know converting that we you know we have to look into inflation let's say if you want to take it from 2012 dollars to 2007 dollars but then like it makes it also tough to compare it to let's say 
stuff going if you if you're given something in euros or pounds per kilowatt hour or it um it makes it a lot harder to compare like projects in one country to another and of course the other thing um, problematic about it is that if you have a power plant that's also co-producing vehicle fuels either hydrogen or gasoline um, then you probably should not be using an LCOE analysis. You probably should just be using a rate of return analysis, which we'll talk about later. So now I want to get into one of the um, main points of the class exercise coming up tomorrow, which is really honing through and uh, understanding the relationship between currency and work, right, and useful work. and Ideally, we would have a currency that actually had units of, of work, like kilowatt hours or something like that. Because currency tells you something about the capability to do work. But obviously, one dollar does not always buy you the same exact amount of useful work. Because you could print money, and if you don't change the amount of power plants or anything like that, clearly the amount of um, useful work that one dollar buys you is going to go down if you start printing money where we haven't changed the amount of power plants in society. So uh, electricity we can think of is a pure form of useful work. It's probably the easiest one to think about because you can basically electricity can be go can go directly into the, u the production of useful work. And um, whereas with um, fuels such as natural gas and um, oil, it's a little bit harder to see what's going on here um, because, you know, methane does, or natural gas doesn't get com directly converted into work uh, at 100%. And um, so it's sometimes, and, and electricity is not the only form of useful work in society. There's also mechanical work. And um, by mechanical work, I typically mean like your vehicle overcoming friction it takes work to overcome friction and that work event came from the chemical exergy in fuels and um, so it's really it's how much work you get out of the fuel which should be thought of you pay so much dollars to get so much useful work out of the fuel when you drive your car but that price that price of work is a little bit more complicated there's a lot more things that go into it as opposed to like electricity you're just that dollar, well, how much you spend for electricity tells you something about the useful um, work that went into making it. So, one option is to, would be to have a um, currency in which you actually keep the price of useful work to be a constant. Okay, so now we're going to be moving on to the, what's called the internal rate of return on investment. And, um, so we're going to work through kind of the way of calculating the IR, what's called the IRR. And um, this is a value. It will give you a value of like percent per year, which you would then compare with other values of IRR for similarly similarly risky projects. And that's the um, that's probably the one caveat is that you, you need to be making sure that you compare the IRR with a similarly risky project. So. The IRR is the interest rate in the net present value calculation such that the net present value is equal to zero. So the net present value we're setting equal to zero uh, and the net present value was equal as we saw before to the summation of the cash flow time series. So here I've got RT and CT here RT being revenues and CT being costs. So. RT has is positive and C's are negative here. Um, sorry, C's are positive and there's a minus sign in front of it. So, and then each year the revenue gets um, multiplied by the 1 plus I to the minus T and we're kind of solving for what value of I makes the net present value equal to zero. And there's two ways to think about it. Um, first is you can think of it as the break-even interest rate to pay a loan back from a bank. So let's say we are a, a company and we want to build a power plant 
and we go to the bank and we ask ourselves what's you know before we go to the bank what is the maximum interest rate that I'm willing to accept from the bank and right, what's that maximum interest rate I'm willing to accept to, to borrow a loan I mean to, to, to borrow money to take out a loan on the capital I need for this power plant so what I would do is I would do an IRR calculation I would sit down and I would write I put in an Excel file where all the costs and revenues and then I would do equal IRR of the uh, of all those cells and I'll give you a value that value is that I set that sets in that present value equals zero so it says here I'm a project and I will have a net present value of, of zero if I have an interest loan from the bank at whatever that value of IRR that you calculated. So now we can switch our way of thinking. Instead of thinking from the side of the bank, we can now see it from our side as the, I mean, seeing it from the company. Now let's look at it from the bank's perspective. The IRR is the rate of return for an equity investor, provided that the profits are reinvested into exactly sim an exactly similar project. So I'm investing into this project. Right, let's say I'm investing a thousand dollars, and then <coughs> I have a that company is going to be paying me back on that loan, based off of the lifetime of the loan and based off of the interest rate. And so the IRR is that interest rate that I'm getting on that project, provided that my profits go back into exactly similar projects. So the IRR calculation requires knowing both the revenues and costs throughout the lifetime of the power plant. And what it does is it, it measures your potential to grow, the potential for growth. It tells you if I invest $100 today, in 10 years, what will be the amount of money, right? So we're talking about growth and the amount of money, which in, the, you know, in this case, if we're talking about inflation adjusted, what we're talking about is growth and the capability to do useful work, right? is a power plant that will be producing more useful work over its lifetime than went into building the useful power plant that, that went into building the power plant so you can think of what should be the definition of a power plant one of the definitions of a power plant should be uh, a project that generates more useful work than it consumes um, to build it and consumes in the in the amount of work required to fuel it, to maintain it, and um, decommission it. So IRR, you can think of in the way um, it can be inflation adjusted if you are using the same year dollars as in your cost estimates. So if the price of electricity you're assuming, if it was the same price of electricity that baseload or whatever type of power plants were getting at the time those cost estimates were being made, cost estimates for capital and labor and fuel, if you use the same um, price of electricity as similar type of projects we're getting at that time, the IRR you calculate is already then going to be inflation adjusted. Right? And which makes sense because you, you can notice there's no units of d dollars in the answer. The answer is in percent per year. Right? It's, it, if you if you just doubled the supply of currency or something like that, it would have no effect on your answer, right? Currency doesn't show up here. And, um, because it would affect your prices and your capital in the same way, and it's going to be ratios that matter to those. So, and, um, what's nice about the IRR is that you can now compare it to a range of different projects. You can compare it to stocks and bonds or treasury bills. Um, of course, the difficulty is how do you calculate the riskiness of a project? It's it's not there's no like straightforward uh, calculation like there is for rates of return, right? You can you can maybe come up with a risk index on something about its standard deviation if you know its past history, right? But we're talking about you know power plants here. We're not talking about past history. We're, you know we need to like how do you estimate the riskiness of building a new power plant? These are very difficult things to calculate, and there's not straightforward equations like there are for the IRR. Okay, now we're going to go through a quick example, um, just because this is a 
probably as simple of an IRR analysis as you can do. We're just going to ask the question, um, what is the IRR of purchasing an annual parking permit rather than semi-annual parking permit? So if the cost of an annual parking permit is $180 due on August 1st, and if the cost of a semi-annual permit is going to be $130 due on August 1st and $130 on January 1st, uh, on August 1st and then on January 1st, what's the rate of return of, of, of on investment of doing the annual permit? So what you can do here is let's talk about everything in a per month basis. And so what we would do is we'd make a cash flow time series and in month of zero we would put minus fifty dollars because the cost of the annual permit is fifty dollars more expensive than the semi-annual permit. And then in month six we would put um a hundred and thirty dollars. Oh sorry. Yeah, a hundred sorry. Yeah, hundred and thirty dollars because we're not spending that money on January first that we would in the semi annual permit. So you can think of this kind of in the I mean, it's not quite like a power plant, but we're invest. You can think of this: we're investing fifty dollars, and six months from now, somebody's going to pay us one hundred and thirty dollars. And so, what's that rate of return on investment? And you can work through what that is, and it's a fairly fairly large number, um, showing that it's it's much much higher than any discount rate should be in society, because it's going to be on the order of like something per month you know, maybe 10% per month or something like that. And, um, which is a huge amount per year. And obviously the choice should always be in this case should be to go with an annual permit. But with having said, not everyone always chooses the annual permit. And, um, it's because perhaps the, re the only reason you wouldn't it would be if there's some kind of huge risk that you wouldn't be there that second semester. Now you, you could also, um, Calculate what the other way of doing this would not be an IRR necessarily analysis, but you ask what's the net present value of purchasing the annual parking permit rather than the semi annual permit if you assume that there's a discount rate of 2% per month? Right, so what you do is you'd say in um, at month zero, I'm going to spend 50 bucks, so I have minus 50. And then in year uh, month six, I'm going to have 130 times 1.02 raised to the minus six power. And you can then calculate that and determine whether or not you have a net present value. Um, if it's positive, the net present value is positive, then you should go with the annual permit. Okay, um, so let's go on to another IRR example. I've shown here uh, four, four different cases, and I've uh, broken down the uh, the cost to do to b do a certain project. It's net annual revenue, it's end of year salvage value, it's lifetime, and then I've already done the hard work of calculating its IRR. Now this is kind of similar to something you should be doing for the class um, the classes activity is going to be on Thursday. I've given you a bunch of capital costs and annual revenues. Uh, we, we're ignoring salvage value for the project, but I think I've given you lifetimes as well. So you should go into the project knowing what the IRRs are going to be. Okay. And uh, the only kind of trick will be one of the projects, of course, will have some risk associated with that. So you need to maybe risk adjust that. And we're not going to cover how you do that. Um, so the question is, the first one we're gonna go, we're gonna just work through. We have these four options, and then we have this option E, which says you can put any amount of money into a savings account that gives earns you an IRR of two percent per year. You can think of option E kind of like in the class project. It's gonna be the we can just spend money and uh, pull some oil, uh, natural gas out of the ground and just store it. Right? You can kind of think of it as that one. It's kind of our you can put any amount that you want into that one, and it gives you some kind of low uh, interest rate. So if I have a thousand dollars, how should I spend the money? Of course, the most obvious one is you look around and you look. Okay, well there's two options that only cost a thousand dollars, so 
I'm going to go with option D. Okay. So now if I have $2,000, where should I invest? Okay, well clearly I should do option D and option A combined. Right? And it's going to yield me probably an average about 9.5% rate of return on investment. Okay, now if, here's a little bit more tricky. If I have $3,000, where should I invest? Should I do D, A, E? Or should I do D, B? And um, so really what we're comparing with is obviously we're going to do D. And it's this question, are we going to do A, E, where I'm putting $1,000 into that 2% per year? Or should I just do B? So B, of that $2,000, I haven't invested in D. I'm going to get a 7% if I put it into B. If I put half into A and half into E, I'm likely only going to get the average of 9 and 2% per year, which is less than 7. Right? It's more like 5.5. So what I, if I have $3,000, I should invest in D and B. And then um, so the last one, if I have $4,000 in which to invest, Clearly this is going to be an easy one again, it's going to be D, A, B. So you're going to have to ask this question a lot in the class activity. You have so much money, you know, where should I be choosing to invest? And you should just go through down the list. Um, but it's going to be a little bit tricky because there may could be cases like that case for the 3000 where you have to actually make some choices. But ideally you should be going after the high interest rate ones first. Um, and now I'm going to, this is a slide that you've seen from the first set of lectures. I'm just putting it back here because in homework number six, you're going to be calculating some rates of return on investment. And I want to make sure you have some values to compare it with um, using it, the same exact um, sale price of electricity of $50 per megawatt hour, which, which will be in all the calculations in, the, uh, in homework number six. And it'll ask you occasionally to compare it to other systems. So here we have um, a wide variety of power plants. Um, not going to go through what all of them are. If you have any questions on them, um, try Google searching the, the acronyms on each one, like PCC, IGCC, and NGC. Um, you can probably guess NGC C means natural gas combined cycle power plant. And that's the one that right now is giving us the highest rates of return on investment. And then there's going to be some other cases. Um, some of the ones on the right are all fuel s fuel cell type systems tied to coal gas fires. And um, all cost estimates, I've just put this for your own information that went into it, are listed here. And now we got time for questions.